We were the lucky country. We went camping on weekends. We played cricket in the park with the family. We spent time making memories that would last forever. Now, we have lost our jobs, our homes, our businesses, and our lives. Our state and federal governments have taken our rights away, destroyed our freedoms, and have been ruling by decree in the name of safety. This is not the new normal. We will not watch our country be run by bureaucrats. We will stand up and we will fight back. It is time to mark the day, the day that matters to every single Australian. That day is Freedom Day. On the 4th of December, we will rise for freedom over fear. We will demand an end to the lockdowns, an end to the state of emergency, and we will demand real leadership. The Liberal Democrats will rise for our day of freedom. We will rise to end the state of emergency. We will rise and take our country back. Will you rise with us on Freedom Day? Freedom Day, December 4, 2021. Join the fight for freedom. Join the Liberal Democrats. Authorised Jay Humphreys, Matt Worley, Victoria. Welcome, everyone. This is a very special event for the Liberal Democrats, our very first new little event called Liberty Chat. Uh, where we're bringing you some of the latest information and news from around the country and everything kind of liberty because there's not a lot of it around uh, in Australia at the moment. So we're just going to take any little bit that we can get uh, and, and bring this to you, our members. So as we've sort of said in the emails, this is an exclusive event. The live event is an exclusive event for our members only. So that way you can register, you can chat directly with our superstars, with our candidates, and we'll bring in different guests throughout every week as well. Uh, and then it will go up for our social media and our website after that. So you as, as our members get to have that sort of VIP sort of treatment. Uh, but yes, as I said, again, this is Liberty Chat. We have our three panellists tonight, uh, Mr. David Limbrick, MP, down there in Melbourne, or down here in Melbourne, I should say. Hi, everyone. Campbell Newman up there in Queensland in Freedom Land and Mr John Ruddick in Sydney, although it looks like he's in the Blue Mountains Blue or Mountains. something. Absolutely. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Well, welcome everyone. As I said, this is really exciting, our first little thing. Um, we've, I think we've been talking about it for a little while, but, you know, whilst we've all been stuck in lockdown, so what else is there to really do apart from put more podcasts out? So it's very exciting. But we're going to launch straight into a very hot topic that happened here in Melbourne today in Victorian Parliament. Um, it's basically a, going to be a Parliament lockout uh, for our two parliamentarians down here in Melbourne. And I now will go straight to Mr David Limbrick to discuss what happened. Let everybody else know. Hi, everyone. Um, so many of you may know that the government's been putting out uh, vaccine mandates in Victoria. So they started with... Uh, you know, uh, aged care workers, then they went to construction workers, and now they've gone to all authorised workers, which is a very large group. Um, we've, of course, opposed these mandates on a few grounds. We oppose them because they, we believe that they invalidate consent. We oppose them for privacy reasons as well. Um, so we've had serious concerns about these mandates all along. Um, however, they wanted to um, mandate not only uh, all authorised workers, but um, members of parliament, which are authorised workers. Yeah. But they discovered after the Premier had already announced it that they can't actually legally do that because of the separation of powers. So what they did in the dead of night last night is they sent out a draft motion that they're going to be debating next week, apparently, in parliament. Um, they're going to put it through the lower house and the upper house, similar things, Effectively, what it's going to do is it's going to instruct Parliament to collect the uh, vaccination certificate information of all members of Parliament and then uh, exclude them from the parliamentary precinct if uh, they either don't hand over their vaccine information or they're not vaccinated, whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> now, we've pre Tim and I have previously stated that we will not uh, comply with this sort of process. So we're both, um, we're both vaccinated. We made that personal choice uh, freely and free of coercion. 
However, because we wanted to stand, uh, make a stand in solidarity with people who uh, have been coerced into this against their wishes um, or, or lost their job, um, we said that we would uh, refuse to comply with it. So it looks like that's going to happen. And so what that means is from next week, probably from Friday, if the motion passes, then um, Tim and I will be uh, unable to enter Parliament. Now, um, you have to think about what's really going on here. Um, it's possible to participate in Parliament now remotely. So you can contribute, uh, you can make contributions remotely, um, you can take part in debates remotely, you can ask questions remotely. The one thing that you really can't do remotely is vote. Um, and that's because of a constitutional issue. In the Victorian constitution, it says quite clearly um, about you have to be in the room or I can't remember the exact words, but it, it's quite clear that it requires a physical presence and would require a constitutional change to change that. So if you've been following what's going on in Victoria, you'll also realize that in December, the emergency powers expire. And the government has been putting through, um, or they have been, there's been media reports about uh, a um, new pandemic legislation, the details of which are currently secret. No one knows what's in it, but it's going to be some sort of per permanent pandemic legislation. And it seems very convenient that um, during that period where they will have to pass that legislation, they're kicking out members of parliament who might be opposing it. And the only thing that they're really doing is taking away their vote. Mm -hmm. So we think this is absolutely outrageous what they're doing. Um, we're fighting it. We're going to cause the biggest stink that you've ever seen. It's already started today. We're on you know, multiple news channels. There's going to be more media articles tomorrow. It's gone all over social media. And we're also talking to international media as well. So um, we're going to tell the whole planet about this. Mm -hmm. The most disappointing part of all this is the Liberal Party of Victoria have publicly said as of today, which was quite shocking to me, that they are supporting what the government's doing. Now, I've spoken to a, a, a number of uh, Liberal Party members of parliament and um, I'm sort of trying to give them a bit of space to change their mind on this because I think this is insane. Um, it was also reported that one of their members is actually, or at least one, is going to uh, refuse to comply as well. So he'll be kicked out. So they're literally throwing their own members under the bus, their own elected representatives, which I just, it, it's unfathomable, unfathomable to me that they would do that, um, you know, that they throw their own members of parliament under the bus to support the Labor Party. Like, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's totally insane. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to fight it. So, but that means we won't be in parliament uh, as of next Friday. We won't be allowed to go into our offices um, so we'll have to do everything remotely, but we can still participate in parliament. So we can have a parliament in exile, which, um, we've got lots of good plans. Stay tuned for that. You'll love it. <laughs> it's going to make some, it's going to make some incredible media. Like it will make international news. Uh, it's absolutely insane. And that's, that's the issue down here as well. We just don't have, we have no opposition here. So it literally is David and Tim and occasionally a couple of others, but that's the opposition to Daniel Andrews here uh, in Danistan. I, I do happen to know that there is a number of MPs um, who may not comply, and I don't want to out them, and I don't want to, um, uh, you know, speak about them. But there are other MPs out there that may not be complying with this. So it might not just be Tim and I. Um, we'll see what happens. Good. Now, we might uh, switch over to some New South Wales news because obviously there's been a lot happening in New South Wales uh, this week. Uh, obviously, there's a new premier. Uh, there's a, a couple of by-elections announced or three by-elections announced um, or three areas announced. So we're going to go to John. Let us, let us know what's happening in, in New South Wales. Okay. Well, look, <clears throat> Don Perrottet, our new premier, is, as far as Liberals go, He's, he's one of the best. I can assure you that I know him quite well. I heard him speak at the Sydney Institute a few years ago and I thought, you know, and when he was the finance minister, I thought, gee, he sounds like Ayn Rand when it comes to economics. And I believe he truly is a really good guy and he's intelligent and he wants to do the right things. However, this is his problem. Half an hour after Gladys resigned, Laura Jays is on Sky News and she says, I've just heard that Michael Fodius is doing the numbers for Don Perrottet. Okay, well, that's a pretty bad sign when the leader of the left 
wants to back him. Okay, now it's not Dom's fault. Okay, but it, that's that's one sign. The second sign was we've got Matt Keane, who really should be in the Australian Greens. He's not an idiot, Matt Keane. I mean, he's very left wing, and I think he's completely wrong on the uh, subject of uh, you know uh, zero, uh, no no carbon emissions or whatever. Uh, but he is now the treasurer of the the largest state in the country. And so, you know, that's, that's effectively the second most important position. Formally, the most important position is uh, the deputy leader of the Liberal Party, which is Stuart Ayres, which most people probably haven't heard of in the whole of New South Wales. Now, this guy truly is a low IQ person and in serious with the left wing of the New South Wales Liberal Party. So, so we have a good leader, but the, the three most important people around him are basically not, and the guy that gave him the job, Michael Fodius, I can't see him really doing much. Now, I look, just having any new Premier was a good thing because we needed a circuit breaker. And if anyone's going to sort of try and sort of get us out of lockdown quicker, it'll be Dom. But the signs are this week, there was a few little amendments, but he's not, it's not like it's that much of a fresh start at all. So that is disappointing. Now, we've got these three by-elections coming up. Now, uh, the New South Wales government got elected in 2011. They have had some horrific by-election results. So, yes, they have got re-elected twice, but like they've, they've had, you know, like 30% swings in, 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 in on some occasions. And on the two most uh, uh, pertinent uh, by-elections, there was one in the two neighbouring seats to, to, to one of these key seats, which is Willoughby, where we're having the by-election. They had a by-election there in the adjoining seat of North Shore three years ago, 20% swing against the government, and in Manly on the same day, also a 20% swing. Now, the, so look, I think we're, I think the Lib Dems, you know, I think I know that we're actively recruiting, and I think there's a couple of very, very high quality people interested, and uh, you know, I think we go all out for that seat. And um, now, now the, now I know that there appears to be a lot of public sympathy for Gladys. Uh, that could all change very quickly in about uh, nine days from now, because the reason she resigned, which has been escaped on most people, she resigned because ICAC has opened a brand new fresh inquiry into, you know, some bad things that she may have done. So mm -hmm. she, she was incidentally in ICAC a year ago because of her former partner, who was exposed as, you know, doing pretty bad stuff. Um, but she was just, just in there sort of, you know, as a, as a cameo appearance. Well, now there's an ICAC appearance exclusively on, on the former Premier. So, look, that's probably going to all blow up while the by-election is on. So we all thought the by-election would be on, you know, pretty promptly, but it's been over a week now, and it's very quiet about when they want to have this by-election. I think they are worried about it. The Liberal Party almost certainly won't hold a Democratic pre-selection, which is going to antagonise the local branch members. So, look, I think with the Liberal Democrats have had a fair bit of positive momentum and buzz in the last few months. This is our first real electoral test and I think we go all out. There's two other very important by-elections in the South, South Coast uh, and the Monero, which is sort of you know, the Snowy Mountains area. So look, if anybody's listening in and, the, and you want to be a candidate or you know somebody who could be a candidate, please get in contact with Kirsty because uh, you know, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to contest all three as hard as we can. Uh, John, just remind everyone where those three locations are. So we've got Willoughby in the heart of the North Shore of Sydney. Then we've got South Coast, which is the very, very most southerly uh, seat in, in New South Wales, so it, it adjoins Victoria. And then the other seat, which is Monero, which basically runs parallel to the South Coast, except that it's uh, inland. And that covers you know, the New South Wales part of the Snowy Mountains. So that's, that's the three areas that we're focusing on. Mm. And we have, we did already send an email out and I'm sure we will do some more, obviously telling people in New South Wales about the by-election and, and as John was just saying, if you think you would like to be a candidate, uh, if you'd like to donate to the cause, if you'd like to volunteer for yep. candidates in the, in the by-election, um, it is a hell of a lot of fun helping out with these things and helping out with pre-polling and even if it's letterboxing and all sorts of stuff. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do as a volunteer. Sometimes it's more of the IT work. It might be some data analysts. Uh, who knows? Now, uh, let's go up to Queensland. Now, Campbell, you have been in the news a lot of talking lately about the net zero issue. So, welcome. And uh, would you like to say something more about that? 
Well, look, I think there's probably two things that have been sort of going on this week. One is the the Premier um, has been continuing to uh, be very vague about when we would open up at what vaccine level and very risk averse, which is which is always her way. However, there's been a very interesting uh, apparent schism between her and the Chief Health Officer. Of course, those Queenslanders watching would know this evening that she will be our new governor in a, in a few months' time, in about a month or two's time. Uh, perhaps uh, she's got the scent of that now in the nostrils and is being a bit more independent because uh, the CHO said something quite similar to our position, not quite the same, but she, she said uh, yesterday that um, she would be, uh, she feels we should be opening up uh, once anybody over the age of 12 has had access to a vaccine. Access. She's talking access, which is our line as well. And she repeated it. Um, now, the Premier is not saying that. So I thought that was a very interesting sort of um, uh, schism there. The other thing that's been going on is we've got hospitals that are at capacity, are over capacity, ambulance rampings rife. And the Premier is sort of being exposed politically because, um, you, know, you know, people are saying, well, you've had 18 months to get ready. Why can't you open up? Well, you can't. You're saying you can't go. Uh, she said the hospitals can't deal with it. The chief health officer said, yes, they can deal with it. So again, more, more division. So interesting on the COVID front. I just make the observation, you know, for, for people in Victoria and to a lesser extent, New South Wales, you know, that, that the feeling, the frustration with lockdowns is not nearly the, the same as what we're seeing, you know, in your, 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 your states. Uh, up here, Queensland is frankly, haven't had that. They haven't had the, the strain of the whole thing. And so they they're not really tending to see that as, in, in, as an issue in the same terms. Um, just going back to what Kirsty asked about in relation to climate change uh, and this whole net zero thing, this is going to be the next big issue. So right now, you know, we have been banging on about COVID and lack of freedom and, and the draconian laws. But the thing that we might be talking about if it's a later election, particularly, I believe will be this net zero thing because the, the, there is a war now between the Libs and the Nats. Um, the Libs uh, uh, got too many woke lefties there who are like people like um, Sharma in, um, in uh, Wentworth in Sydney, uh, people like Julian Simmons here in Brisbane uh, and others who are just pushing hard for this net zero 2050 thing. But meantime, you've got here in Queensland, you've got you know, people from the Nats like Canavan who obviously are going to stand up for the, and, and, and to be honest, he does a good job in standing up for, for the coal communities. Well, my, my line has been, and I'm just going to be pushing this really, really hard from now on, is that they will be sold out. The, the rural communities, the resources communities are going to be sold out. People's livelihoods and jobs are on the line. And you just cannot trust Scott Morrison, the coalition, because at the end of the day, they will capitulate to international pressure. And I think that's really important for people to think about, while well, particularly for those of you in Victoria and New South Wales, you know, the, one of the tricks about politics is you've got to know where the debate's going to go, what's going to happen next. If you nail all your colours to one issue, you know, to that mast, if the game moves on, you, you're sort of, what have you got left? So we've got to be always thinking about what is going to be the next big issue. So we've got to bang on about COVID. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to push hard on that because what's happening is a disgrace, and particularly what's happened to David and to, to Tim is about to happen is just appalling. And, and it's, but it's an opportunity to demonstrate to people who feel like us, who are still in the Liberal Party in Victoria, that they should be upping stakes and moving and joining us. If, if the new Liberal leader is gonna support that, he's lost all credibility. Anyway, those are my, my quick thoughts. Well, that leads into a question. I might just bring this question up now because it relates into that. And it's um, it's from Brett and asking about the Lib Dems policy on nuclear energy. So we can obviously go from that. And I know it's definitely one of uh, David's most favourite topics. And in fact, David, a couple of years ago, hosted Australia's first Stand Up for Nuclear Day, which was actually pretty awesome. We had a lot of fun with that as well on the steps of Parliament House. It was pretty wild. Um, but David, uh, would you like to talk about one of your favourite topics. Yeah, so <clears throat> back in 2019, I organised the first uh, pro-nuclear demonstration in Australian history. Um, and it was pretty cool. It was like most wholesome 
a lot different to the demonstrations these days. We didn't get uh, shot at or anything. It was uh, yeah, actually pretty we had wholesome. Balloons and bananas and everything. Yeah, we had balloons and fun. stuff, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we just got a whole bunch of speakers, including an ex-state uh, um, labor energy minister, believe it or not, um, and some uh, experts in nuclear energy. And we just spoke to like there was about a group of a hundred or so people. And um, yeah, that was great. And another thing that we did in 2019 is I got Victoria's, um, we had an inquiry on the Environment and Planning Committee and the Liberal Democrats put up a inquiry into nuclear prohibition in Victoria. And um, we were one of the first places to ban uh, nuclear energy and not just nuclear energy, we ban even exploration for uranium in Victoria, um, which is pretty crazy. But yeah, about Liberal Democrats policy. Um, so we're not pro any sort of energy source, we are energy um, neutral. So what we believe is that there should be no uh, particular prohibitions on energy sources. So we support repealing prohibition of nuclear energy and uh, any sort of development to develop that industry. Um, but we also oppose uh, subsidies on any particular sort of energy. So we oppose, uh, you know, like uh, renewable subsidies. So we want a level playing field. That's basically our policy. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, you know, like Campbell, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, energy policy, um, but I feel that one of the big mistakes that Australia made was um, prohibiting nuclear energy. And um, we have to reverse that mistake because like, I mean, coal still plays an important part and will continue to play an important part in the energy mix. And there's many applications that you just require coal, like steel smelting and things like that. Um, however, there's certainly going to be a demand for um, carbon-free energy and the, the places that have very high carbon-free energy output usually have nuclear as part of the mix. So it seems crazy to um, tie our hands behind our back, especially when we have such vast stores of uranium in this country. We, ha we already have a nuclear industry in, in the fact that we have a nuclear reactor in Sydney, which is very successful at producing um, medical isotopes and doing research and all sorts of stuff. Um, I see no reason at all we couldn't expand that into the energy sector as well. Mm -hmm. And David, um, there's a, obviously there's a bunch of comments about nuclear in our chat box now, but um, what would you all. say is the is the like the simplest way to um, explain how how nuclear energy is a clean green energy solution? Like if someone says, oh, but what about Fukushima? What about Chernobyl? What is the easiest thing that someone could say? Uh, to something like that. Nuclear energy is the only energy source where all of the waste from it is totally uh, captured and managed. Every other energy source um, either releases material is into the atmosphere or you end up with um, other types of waste, like, you know, with, with wind turbines and stuff, you end up with, you know, rubbish at the end of it. Some of it you can recycle, you know, you can recycle the steel in wind turbines and stuff. But nuclear waste, the, the amounts of waste that we're talking about are very, very tiny. We have the technology. In fact, we've had the technology for many, many years to manage it. And although there have been a number of accidents, um, you will find if you look at the numbers that nuclear is actually the safest form of energy production per terawatt hour. In fact, I used to be, believe it or not, I used to be lots of things. I used to be anti-nuclear. And the thing that convinced me that nuclear was um, not such a demon was actually the Fukushima disaster. Um, so Kirsty's probably heard this story a million times, but I used to live in Japan. Um, my, my wife is Japanese. And when Fukushima happened uh, after, the, after the tsunami, I was absolutely terrified um, because I had family and friends over there. Um, you see all these stories about radiation and all this sort of stuff. And I did a lot of research on it. Like I actually have a degree in physics, but um, I didn't know much about radiation and its effects on the body and this sort of thing. And I did a lot of research and, you know, I was looking at what's actually happening over there. And I concluded, and this is scientific fact, that I, actually I would have got more radiation by traveling in an airplane going to Japan than I would have got uh, south of Tokyo where my in-laws lived. And the reason is, you know, when you go in an airplane, you go up high in the atmosphere and there's cosmic radiation that gets you. And if you look at the death rate from Fukushima, 
No one died from radiation. No one died from the nuclear accident. Lots of people died from the tsunami um, and, and it was an awful, awful disaster. And lots of people died because of the, the panicked evacuation um, because um, there was lots of aged care homes and things like that. And uh, it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible thing what happened. They basically became refugees in their own country. But no one died from the radiation and it's predicted by most of the modeling that I've looked at that no one will. Um, don't, make, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to downplay it. It was a terrible accident. Um, it's going to cost a, a crap load of money to fix um, and, and they're managing it. But uh, as far as safety is concerned, um, you know, it's, it's one of the safest, it's the safest, I think, form of energy production that we have. Um, you know, people always talk about hydro. Hydro is actually, hydro dams are actually the most uh, devastating. If a, if a dam bursts, um, you know, in China a few years ago, there was like thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. Um, you know, coal is important, but air pollution, it kills people. Like it, lung cancer and all these sorts of things, um, it definitely kills people. Um, wind turbines even, um, people forget about the, um, the way that they're produced. They need, to, uh, they need to produce all sorts of rare earth elements, which are very um, problematic in their production, like for the magnets, neodymium. And um, yeah, and there's lots of waste as well, like mountains and truckloads of waste. So the amount of waste from nuclear reactors is actually very small and manageable. So um, anyway, that's my nuclear pitch. But... <laughs> <laughs> and we've got we've got more uranium reserves than any other country on earth and we haven't even been looking for it yeah and uranium is effectively a renewable resource um, because it's constantly being created in the earth and it's actually possible to even mine it from seawater there's new technologies to um, extract it using nanofibers from seawater the only reason that they don't do that is because it's much easier to just dig it out of the ground but Basically, we're never going to run out of it is the, is the upshot, yeah. I'd just add, just so people know, when I was Premier, um, my government reversed the ban on uranium mining, exploration and mining in Queensland. Good sadly, it, sadly, the ban has been then put slapped back in place by the Labor Party. But uh, we live in hope. Yeah. Well, there actually is a, a, an amusing comment in the chat uh, from a David as well. Daniel Andrews is more of a disaster than Fukushima. That is <laughs> very... More very, people have died too. Yeah. yeah, way more people have died. Exactly. They're not even joking, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly right. Well, we might actually change it up a little bit because um, I'm not sure. I hope that everyone here tonight is following not only uh, John and David on Twitter, but also Campbell Newman. And Campbell's been collecting some of his perhaps not so nice tweets. And of course, you know, social media is a, a wonderful place full of lots of good vibes and it's all only positive, you know, self-improvement stuff on there. But uh, Campbell, uh, would you like to read out some of your more um, yeah. spicy ones? Well, I think this is these are sort of legacy issues, I think, from being in government. Um, so I've, I've got a few, few, few bad ones, and I've got one good one just to cheer, cheer everyone up afterwards. I, I know you'll all just feel as bad about this as, as I do, of course. Um, <laughs> so the first one is from Chook Dude on Twitter on the seventh of October. You're still a bitter little. Uh, I think the, there's an acronym here, something about something about next Tuesday or something. But I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> Water Street Wafflings on Twitter from the 7th of October. WTF was that garbled jingle at the end, question mark, question mark. F me, what a winner. <laughs> nice to see everyone's favourite <clears throat> back and communicating with his <clears throat> and brain confused. Uh, then there's Brenna Cooney on Facebook. He's brave. Um, 5th of October. Oh, look. It's can't do soup can as it added again. I thought he died. Shame. Uh, and the final one was the final one from Ryan, who I think he must be confused about sort of exactly uh, who I'm with these days. This was on Facebook. You're a disgrace to the nation. Berejikli in 2.0. Morrison 2.0. Another corrupt liberal pig. Shame on you and your green fake version of our Australian constitution that you believe is law. If wow. your corrupt party, I guess this means the Lib Dems, follow the actual constitution written by we the people, uh, read an original version, then you corrupt pricks wouldn't even qualify for Centrelink 
payments, you're that corrupt. Wow. Okay. Well, wow. Everything that, one. Well, yeah, that one I that one I'm that one I'm still working on. Um, but you know, the, the one I can't read out, which is the ni the nice one, which I'll just hold up, it goes from there down to there. So it's obviously not Twitter, it's Facebook, but it says uh, Rod Ritchie said you get a few people who use this Facebook profile to criticize and play politics, and they're probably going to try to turn my comments around for that political purpose, but it won't change what I'm about to say. I remember you being premier but I don't remember what you did to lose favour. I do think you're a good man with good intentions. You may have fallen for the same trap that most politicians fall into, and that is to take citizens for granted as you aim for your goals. And it goes on from there, but very thoughtful um, and quite perceptive contribution. Anyway, you've got to generally, generally, it's well, generally on Facebook and Instagram, it's very, very good. Twitter, well, that's I'm another sorry. thing. Have you, well, have you discovered the mute button on uh, on Twitter, Cam? I, I, it's better than blocking. No, no. Blocking's too aggressive. But I, 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 I share I share I share with you that one evening when I was doing a program with another former Queensland Premier, um, we were travelling back from North North Sydney to the airport, and I heard I heard him fiddling with his phone, and then Peter Beattie said, "Cam, Cam, this 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 Twitter," because he was just getting onto it. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you do you sort of respond to people? I went because it was after the show. I went, Peter, no, never <laughs> transmit. <laughs> do not receive. Uh, well, there's a comment here from Jim saying, I bet John gets some stupid tweets as well, and especially from Pirate Pete. And we all know who Pirate Pete is. Well, look, Pirate Pete, yes, yes. He, he Would you like to say, if, in case anyone doesn't know, who is Pirate Pete? Peter Fitzsimons, you know. Oh, uh, Bandana. You know. Campbell. Bandana man. <laughs> Sorry. What was yeah. I was away. I was away. I was thinking. He, he, uh, look, he took a particular interest in me when I was going to be running for Warringah because he was sort of the person that sort of was, you know, largely Zali Stegall's campaign manager. So he, and then, you know, the Freedom March, he took, you know, just the unbelievably, the intense malicious abuse that I got saying that I'm going to come back to Warringah and give everybody COVID. Well, nobody got COVID at the Freedom March. Nobody's caught COVID <laughs> outside since the whole bloody thing began. New York Times said that. And I've uh, certainly reminded Pirate Peter that a few times. But we've had, we've had a, he challenged me to a $10 bet this week to, um, to see if the Lib Dems can get more than 10% in the Willoughby by-election. Now, I really want to back up what Kirsty was saying. We need volunteers. We need to mobilise like never before. We're going to pretend this is like our World War II. So yeah. let, let's do everything. we and, and it is fun, as Kirsty said, but let's get into it. Well, actually, uh, John, there's a comment here or a question here from Cameron. Uh, can we get a public debate between John and Pirate Pete? No, I was thinking about that this week. I mean, uh, I know the Lib Dems don't have a strong view. They don't have a position on the, the Republic versus constitutional monarchy. But he thinks he's a, he thinks he's such a historical genius. Uh, when yes, when this campaign's out of the way, I'd love to have a debate with him about so whether Australia should be retain, remain a constitutional monarchy or become a republic. That's another comment from Joshua saying, "Boy, do I hate Pirate Pete, the commie from Double Bay, uh, first millionaire pirate I've ever seen from Adam." <laughs> That's that. Yeah, people are big fans of, uh, of Pirate Pete. Now yes. we're going to make it a bit more serious again. We've had a bit of a laugh. John, I know that you are a bit of a history buff, and I know that you've got a little, a, a quite an interesting topic for us tonight. So we need That's to come up with a little, a little, um, a title for your little history segment, and you can think about something for next week. Okay, I've got a good little history story. It'll only take me a couple of minutes. Uh, that's particularly relevant to the Liberal Democrats. Now, there are no two countries on earth which are more similar. Uh, constitutionally and in many other ways than Canada and Australia. So we're both constitutional monarchies, we're both federations, we've got bicameral parliaments, we've, we've got roughly a similar population, we've got similar histories, we've got similar economies. This is when an Australian and a Canadian meet if they're in a third country, you know, they usually get on very, very well. Now, when it is often said about the Australian constitution that we borrowed heavily from England and from the United States, I've done a deep dive into those constitutional conventions for the last couple of years about in the 1890s. They were talking about Canada more than any other country because Canada had had a peaceful, just like we did in 1901, Canada had a peaceful, uh, you know, became independent in the 1860s and we were also peacefully leaving England and we 
follow the Canadian precedent in a big way. Now, why is this important? Canada, like Australia, had had, up until the 1990s, two, political, two major political parties. There was a party on the left, which happened to be called the Liberal Party, and there was the oddly named Progressive Conservative Party, which had been around since the 1860s. And those two parties were like our Liberal and Labor. They were the only two parties of government. And the, in, the, in the 1980s, a little party, a little libertarian party, started in Western Canada called the Reform Party, started by a guy who, who wasn't a politician. His father had been the premier of one of those big Western states called Preston Manning. And if you look up and see what he was standing for when he started his little party, it's quite similar to the Liberal Democrats. It's very similar on economics. They were a more socially conservative party than we are, but generally, you know, most, most legislation is about economics. Um, now, so they start this little party and they go well. They start winning a few seats and they start winning a few by-elections. And then in the 1992 federal election, the, the progressive conservative party completely collapsed and the Reform Party won about 50 seats in their House of Commons. And I think they've got about sort of 350 seats in the House of Commons. And then by the late 90s, that little Reform Party had become the official opposition party in the Canadian Parliament. The Liberal Party was all supreme at that time under Jean Chrétien. But now then the, um, <clears throat> in 2004, that Reform Party moved from opposition to government. Uh, under Stephen Harper. Now, Stephen Harper was basically the deputy lieutenant of Preston Manning, who started this little party. Now, it, what happened in about 2000, just to, so you got the full picture, in about 2000, it was pretty obvious that this great, this great old party of Canadian history, the Progressive Conservatives, it was you know, dying a slow death. And, and they hated the Reform Party, but they basically knocked on the door of the Reform Party and said, look, okay, we've got all this infrastructure and we've got this brand and everything. Why don't we merge in? Okay, it wasn't a merge. It was a mopping up operation because the Reform Party had about four times the amount of MPs that they'd had. And then Stephen Harper came along and look, he was a pretty successful prime minister. So my point is fellow Liberal Democrats, you know, while it might seem as though, you know, we have a tough slog ahead of us and you know, this federal election is a huge deal. Uh, you know, I want you to know, I'm certainly around for the long haul. And if there's any party in the world that I think that we can get inspiration from, and a, a model of, of what, what we can do in Australia because it's, it's a very, very similar country constitutionally and politically. And I believe we can do it. And last thing I'll say, Kirsty, on this is just like our Liberal Party today, which has been in power for a long time, I'm not just talking about recently, but historically, it's an old party. The progressive conservatives were like today's Liberal Party before this new up and comer, this, uh, you know, their reform party came along. The Progressive Conservative Party was just an old, creaking old party. It, had, you know, it, was in the, it was in power when this little party started up the Reform Party. So that's certainly a party that I get inspiration from. And I hope this little story has given some fellow Liberal Democrats also some inspiration. Yes. Well, I mean, we also think about the Act Party in New Zealand. Uh, yeah. getting, what was it, 10 elected? Like, that's an amazing result for a, a little libertarian party. And, you know, that's, we've actually got, I know we've got at least two um, uh, members here in, uh, in Melbourne who are ex-members of ACT over there and they've moved over here to Australia. Wow. So, um, yeah, they've, they've been interesting to have a couple of chats with. Um, and I, think, I think the libertarian party did well in the recent German election as well. So libertarian yeah. votes is going, is yeah. going up around the place, yes. Yep, I, that's for sure. I'd add that um, <clears throat> I've said this many times and everyone's probably sick of he hearing me say it, but um, the people that appreciate liberty the most are those that have lost it and everyone in Australia has lost it to some degree now. Yes. And I think that explains a lot to do with what happened in New Zealand recently. It explains a lot to do with what we're seeing with the rise of libertarian ideas in other countries and in this country as well. Yeah. Yep, spot on. Well, we've got a few, um, I guess, well, actually, there's a couple of questions, David, about um, your stance against the Vax passport mandate in Victorian Parliament. So Ryan's asked a question, but also uh, Rowan sort of mentioned it in the chat box as well about, um, you know, it, it's, I get your stance trying to stand up against a mandate in Victorian Parliament, but I think it's more important to be there and have your vote count. 
uh, and Rowan said a similar thing. If you believe your resulting vote will stop Dan's legislation, which side do you think you might fall in? So can you perhaps explain why you and Tim are making this stand? Because obviously we want to have you both in Parliament and speaking because we, well, you know, we get to see some great little clips. It's been an interesting few days in Parliament with some of those Labor women uh, screeching over the last few days. But um, so, David, do you want to perhaps explain why you've taken this stand in particular? Like, I mean, I, I thank you for it, um, and I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere, right? Um, eventually, you have to get to the point with this creeping, you know, totalitarianism that we're seeing in Victoria, where you say, okay, I'm not going to comply with this anymore, right? This is too far. Um, and that's the, that's the line when when they when they when they try to um, dictate medical procedures based uh, like dictate whether or not you can be an elected representative based on what medical procedures you've had. Um, this is way 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 over the line. Now, Kirsty mentioned about not seeing us in Parliament. As I said, we can still participate in Parliament remotely. So I can almost guarantee that the that it will be more entertaining than normal. But what we can't do is vote. And yes, I appreciate the feedback that I've been getting from a lot of people that, um, you know, they want me in there to vote. The reality is that the government can get the numbers, whether we're there or not. Um, I hate to break it to you. Uh, you know, we're not the deciding vote on this. There's 12 cross benches. They only need three to pass anything. Um, but what, what if the Liberals back down, which I expect is a, a, a possibility, not a probability, but if they did back down, would your votes then become critical? Uh, for what? For the... For the emergency, extending the emergency. Uh, so, the, no, the emergency... Uh, look, no one's seen any new pandemic le legislation yet, right? So we don't even have a view on it because we haven't actually seen it, right? But right. Um, I'm sort of presuming that the Libs would oppose that. Um, but the Libs are, have support. Matt, Matthew Guy said today that he's going to support this rule, whatever it is, to prevent... To, to no, that's a different thing, though. Okay. So that's that's to remove members of parliament okay. for um, not disclosing their vaccination status. Now, if they, if they backflipped on that, which, you know, I don't know if they're going to or not, I can't speak for them, but I've been pushing them and giving them a little bit of space to backflip if they want to... Um, you know, then it would be up to the crossbench, right? It would be up to the crossbench on whether they want to support the government or not. And then we're back into the white hot heat on the crossbench. Now, of course, we're not going to support it. So I don't know who would, but the government's going to have to do a deal with someone to get the support. If they've got the Liberal Party supporting it, then the crossbench is irrelevant, right? Yeah. So can I can I just sort of jump in to, to back David and Tim in terms of the call they're making on this? And I don't know what things they'll be getting up to but I can only imagine, I know it will be well executed and get a lot of publicity. And that's the point. If they go in there, if they, if they, if they capitulate, hand over their, their vaccination record, go into the parliament and vote, it goes under the radar, then that would be my judgment. It, this is the way to highlight the unacceptable draconian and anti-democratic nature of what is happening. It is also going to magnify. Well, it it, it 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 magnifies our ability to demonstrate that the Liberal Party have completely sold their souls. That they they, they they have no principles. They have no. They they're not adhering to the values, their stated values, and and that is. In, I think that's very important to us in terms of support, getting people to 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 defect, etc. You know, campaign contributions, the whole thing, and and. You know what what David and Tim are doing are doing proposing to do is the right way to do this. The vote is frankly irrelevant. Yeah, and and like I mean, I hate to agree with you on that, Campbell, but you're exactly right. Um, the vote really is pretty much irrelevant. Like we're not a deciding vote. The government never negotiates with us. They never try and do deals with us. And I take that as a badge of honor, right? I'm I'm happy that they don't even consider that we would, um, you know. Uh, bend our principles or anything like that. They just wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't do it. Um, but, you know, like what we're doing, I think as well, is actually helping. You know, what we've got to do is change public opinion on things. And I think that what we're doing with this 
is doing that. Like, I'll give you an example. The Age is going to run a special on this thing tomorrow, right? Um, can you believe it? The Age, right? They're actually concerned about what's going on now. Like, there's a line for everyone here. And, you know, maybe they've crossed it for The Age. Like, I know that The Age has been written a few articles recently that have surprised me, actually, that have been highly critical of things that the government's doing. But I think a lot of people are looking at, hang on, the government is kicking out members of parliament before voting on some of the most controversial legislation in our history, like that hasn't even been released to the public for consultation. Like there's a few people waking up now and going, hang on a minute, this is, something smells funny here. Like at the same time as there's corruption inquiries, um, all these other things that are happening and we're still locked in our houses, uh, come on, like, freaking wake up people like this is bad shit's going down right so yeah. i mean we've got to keep our eye on the objective our objective right now is to build the numbers uh, in terms of membership of the party get people who want to support us but may not want to join get campaign contributions and highlight the issue as as strongly as we can in 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 the media and that is what david and tim are going to achieve i'd be pretty confident about that mm. Well, it's going, to be, it. it's, going to, it's going to be damning for the Liberal Party if the age comes out and takes your side, uh, you and David, and the Liberal Party's taking Dan Andrews' side. Yeah, yep. I mean, look, I don't know what they're going to say. I can't predict what the newspaper's going to say. They ran a story on it today and it was pretty straight sort of story. They weren't, I was sort of worried that they were going to smear me or attack me, but I think we're sort of getting to the stage where, you know, calling me an anti-vaxxer or an extremist or something like, I'm literally just trying to defend basic civil liberties. That's what I'm trying to do, right? Very, very basic stuff here. Like this should be part, this should be integral to our society and our Western civilization. And they've just abandoned it. And they're labeling someone who's defending these principles as extremists. Like, come on, guys. It's crazy. And in fact, um, and even sort of around that, I suppose, and I'm going to sort of combine two questions in here. We've got a... Uh, a question and a comment, I suppose, from Jim. Lots of smoke. Is there any fire around the corruption claims on Dan? Because that could be a game changer. And I'm going to add that into a comment or a question from Harvey and WA about, you know, what about the checks and balances on premiers? So all these premiers who have become little, um, uh, little kings, I suppose, of their own little states, where are the checks and balances? Um, Campbell, maybe with your experience as an ex-premier, like, um, <laughs> well, well, there aren't. If there's a state that has the fewest, I've got to, be, I've got to be up front and say it's Queensland because there's, there's no upper house. Yeah. So it, it starts from there. But and don't um, you worry about that. Well, the the thing, the comment I'd make though about the Queensland scene on this is that the, from for my, while I'm while I'm a very big critic of the Crime and Corruption Commission because of the way they operate up up here, they work far better than. I've observed IBAC working in Victoria or uh, ICAC in New South Wales. I mean, ICAC are a disgrace the way they're going about business. Um, uh, that, that's not me, by the way, defending Gladys Berejiklian. It's just an observational process. IBAC in Victoria, I, I, I got the biggest surprise, uh, you know, uh, that this week when I saw that the stories about the investigation or the two investigations into the Andrews government because um, I just thought they'd been asleep at the wheel. Um, but, but so Queensland's got a pretty good regime um, and I, I, I think it works better up here is what I'd say. But, but it does pose the question, when this is all over, um, what, what is the appropriate way to deal with what has happened, the damage that's been caused that is unwarranted, unjustified? And I'm talking about, you know, and in, inquiries in various states about, you know, in, into the, the public health orders, the administration of those orders, the actions of the police. I mean, the Victorian police, there should be a Royal Commission into them. And, I, and I, I'm just horrified by what I've seen. So anyway, those are just a few, few comments on, on some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, if the... Look, if you're asking for my opinion on, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, look, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have visibility into what was going on. I don't know exactly what they're investigating. So I'd only be speculating, um, you know, as to the criticisms of IBAC, I would add that they've been sort of 
starved of funding a bit, which doesn't help. Um, they have said that they can't, you know, investigate everything that they want to investigate just due to resourcing. But I suppose every government agency always says that about everything. So who knows? But um, yeah, look, I, I really don't know the answer to it. And look, we're not passing judgment on anything. We're waiting to see what happens. You know, we'll be watching it closely, of course, but um, we don't really know is the answer. Mm. Now I'm going to skip back to some of the stuff we we're talking about earlier as opposed to going back to COVID of course uh, we've got and mostly because this this uh, question that I'm going to talk about is affects me as well so I want it answered and, and we spoke about it a bit earlier but a question from Kate who's down here in Victoria what are your thoughts on the mandated mask wearing for children from grade three and above here in Victoria and John was saying that New South Wales have got it too and Kate says I have two beautiful little girls that will now be forced to cover their faces at school uh, and I know when they go back well I, uh, they were doing like just two days a week anyway and Kate also says I just had my first jab yesterday because I'm in an industry where it's mandated now they're coming after my children the more we comply with the government the more they want it's disgusting what they're doing. It's absolutely it's disgusting. outrageous. It's absolutely disgusting. It's outrageous. Um, look, I've said all along that and that masks should have never have been mandatory. In fact, when masks were recommended not to be used, I was I'm on the record asking questions to the government about why they're not recommending and explaining about mask usage because I was looking at other countries like Japan and other countries that were educating their, their citizens on, you know, what masks are good for, what they're not good for, how to use them properly, all that sort of thing. And then they went straight from, no, you shouldn't buy one, you're taking away essential PPE from healthcare workers, et cetera, to mandating them for everyone, right? They just, they, this government and, and, the, and the health bureaucrats, they haven't got the faintest idea about uh, anything voluntary. They don't trust the population. The only thing they know how to do is use a great big stick. Um, now, when you, you know, Campbell was talking about the police before, right? Now, I've been very, very critical of the police over the last year, but I'll tell you one thing. I do feel sorry for them in the way that they've been asked and forced into enforcing these stupid rules and regulations that should never have been rules and regulations. And you know, every time you see a, a, a policeman shoot a protester or shove a mask over some woman's face or something, remember that it's the it's the chief health officer's directions that do that. It's not the police. I'm going to disagree with you there, mate. On a little <laughs> bit, I'm going to disagree. I'm so shocked about what yeah. I've seen. They it should actually shocking. they 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 should be standing up and saying we cannot do this anymore. We will not do well, this anymore. I, I think you know. I think. You know, I've I've tried really hard. I've tried really hard to to actually blame you know the commissioner and, and other senior people, but I think it's got to the point where you know it, it just you know when I was in the military, and this was at a young age when I was being trained, we were taught about lawful commands, mm. and we were taught about the we were literally taught about what came out of Nuremberg, and the whole thing about the Nazi regime. You know, there comes a point where, you know, the things we've seen in Victoria, you know, firing rubber bullets at people, um, you know, you know, sort of a spraying pepper spray on a woman on the ground, um, crash tackling a guy who's just talking to several police from behind and smashing his head in Friendly Street Station, that was, that was all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, they, they really should be leaving in droves. If they, ha if they, if they had... If they, if they were doing what they should be doing and taking an ethical position, they should be saying enough's enough. There should be an internal revolt going on. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, and look... I'm I've, not I've letting them... I guess I'm not... Life. What I'm saying is I'm not letting off the rank and file off the hook down yeah, there yeah. anymore. Yep. And I've spoken and to a lot huge, of police officers. I'm a huge well. fan of the police. In fact, I've got police up here I'm, 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 who are asking me to support them against being required to be vaccinated. I'm trying to see if I can support them off to the side and keep them anonymous, but sort of be their spokesperson. I'm happy to do that. So I support people who, you know, get their role and, and what policing's about. But, you know, jeepers, you know, Victoria, Victoria has crossed the line. Yeah, I, I'm definitely with Campbell on that one, having been the victim of some police brutality myself about a month ago uh, when I was just taking some photos of other police brutality. Um, 
Uh, and I, my father-in-law was a police officer and we are now very much against uh, police. And in fact, we were driving uh, the other day and um, there was a police car beside us and our son gave the cops the finger. And I was actually proud of him. And if he'd done that, you know, six months ago, he would have got a slap on the hand for doing that. I've never seen him do it, but I was like, you know, you go kid. Um, that's a, and that's a brave act. That's a brave act of dissent there from your car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, he heard the story how I was slammed into a wall by six police officers. So, yeah, we don't have any sympathy for police now around this place. Um, uh, there's a question here which I think is very important from Craig. Does Queensland accept Victorian refugees? Campbell, help us. Ah, that's a very good question. Please. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You got to leave your socialist views behind you. The, so the Victorian socialist ethos. Well, look, well, I'll say this: I don't get why the polls keep showing this bloke still going fairly well in political terms. So um, we hope you. We hope if you wish to come to Queensland, we'll welcome you with open arms. But please leave all that claptrap in Victoria. <laughs> Well, Sorry, I'm, David. I'm fearful for Victoria and that there's been, I saw the figures of who, what state most people have left the most in the last oh. pandemic began. It's huge oh, in Victoria. It is. I'm guessing that those people that are leaving generally are intelligent people who are, you know, don't vote for socialist lunatics. So when those people leave, fortunately, it doesn't help. Now, look, I, mean, no, I wouldn't be helping. saying, you know, I, I'm not going to, if anybody wants to swim across the Murray and come to New South Wales, we will welcome them, no question. <laughs> um, by the way, just on that, there are actually figures. That I've seen figures that were up to the end of March. So that's before you know, the terrible stuff of this year. And Victoria had a huge number of departures, more than any other, other state, net departures. And it was a Commonwealth Bank briefing, actually, for property people. And they said this is the, the Victoria's population has actually declined. And the only time that that has happened before was back in World War One. Mm. What was it? I think it was like forty-three thousand. It was about forty thousand. Yeah, yeah, forty-three thousand yeah. have left. It's it's mm. look. I think that that's the permanent population, but the 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 floating population has massively declined mm. because all of the the tourists, the uh, students. foreign students. Yep. Um, the people on working holidays, um, people staying from overseas with their family that live here, they're all gone. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite, quite, quite spooky. Like if you walk, you know what the occupancy rate in Melbourne CBD is at the moment? I read this the other day. It's absolutely shocking. 6% oh. commercial occupancy rate. 6%. Can you believe it? Yeah. It's like, and I tell you what, if you go for a walk around the CBD, it is the most depressing thing that you've ever seen in your yeah. life. For lease signs, as far as the eye can see, yeah. it's just absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. And then they're also bringing in Sally Cap, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, bringing in all the VAX passports to go to the library, to use any sort of city or municipal buildings. Basically, if you want to go into the city of Melbourne, you'll have to be... Um, show your vaccination passport uh so it's 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 a yeah, big yeah. so excluding 10 percent of the population at least 10 percent of the population from the city is really going to help like, yeah. it's just nuts and then not only the people who are unvaccinated but the people there's so many comments from people saying you know i've i've been vaccinated but i disagree with this um mm. similar to your uh, um, position on the going into parliament house and then, then they're not going to go in. Or what about when you've got uh, couples who one's vaccinated and one's not? You can't. You're not going to go out for dinner anywhere. Uh, you can't they're, go out for dinner. They're tearing apart the social fabric of our society with this. Mm. Um, they're they're tearing it apart. Like, the, like one of the rules, like for our interstate friends, you know, like I had to explain this to someone um, to an American recently that I was talking to. They had no idea. They couldn't believe it. Like you have to, if you're meeting someone in the park, you have to, you can have a group of vaccinated people at a certain limit or a group of unvaccinated people, you can only have a couple. So they're forcing you to inquire, like with friends, to inquire about the medical status of your friends yes. before you meet them in the park, right? Yeah. And then if you find out that you're not, that one of your friends is, you know, one of the new underclass, you're meant to exclude them from your, from your, gathering like how in how on like how can they come up with these things like i just i just can't believe 
that they keep talking about the medical advice. I tell you what, if some public health official gave me medical advice like that, I'd get different bloody medical advice. Like mm. they're, they're advising, they're literally advising you to divide up society and segregate society. And look, I mean, I think maybe one positive I've heard from New South Wales with the new premier, you know, ever the optimist that I am, but, you know, I'll, I'll try and be a little bit optimistic, is he he said that he challenged something that the, that the Cho said. I mean, God, that's their bloody job, isn't it? They have to take moral responsibility for what's happening, not just parrot whatever the whatever the public health team says, like they've got to take other things into account. Mm. Mm, that's right. Uh, there's, I will address, there's a lot of comments in here and I'm seeing my phone flash up with it as well about um, an episode of a podcast that David's been on before called Discernible and Discernible are definitely friends of Liberal Democrats uh, because we're, whilst we we're talking about Vic Pohl, there is um, a serving police officer on there um, who's been um, talking about her, her resignation. And uh, yes, people, a lot of people are saying, are you seeing this? So they're obviously watching two things at once. Um, <laughs> and yes, that, that, uh, that lady is a friend of the party and I'm sure we'll hear from more from her very soon. Um, well, we're coming up to the hour, so we might just go through. Oh, actually, there's, a, there's some interesting ones that are more about politics I suppose and how how politics works and let me find that one again but just someone a couple of questions asking about um, this kind of voting for here we go so anonymous attendee I'm still pretty new to politics I have heard that when voting for a smaller party that the vote also goes to one of the bigger parties for example voting for the Greens will also contribute a vote to Labor could you please explain this a bit more when voting for the Liberal Democrats, where exactly does the vote go? Will our votes for the Liberal Democrats somehow contribute to Labor or Liberal? I think Who any of us can that? explain that, but probably Campbell's the most qualified. So, oh, God, I'm, I'm not on numbers, man. I'll just put it <laughs> like this. I mean, we have we have compulsory... Well, it, it depends on the jurisdiction and the, the election you've got. In Queensland, we've had compulsory and then optional preferential voting systems, and it it keeps being changed because people want to rig, rig elections, but that's a different different sort of story. Um, so at federal level, there's basic um, um, compulsory uh, preferential voting. So what's what's happening is you you play you've got to say in the House of Reps, so it's easy to describe. You've got say four or five candidates. You've got the Lib Dems there, and you've got say Labor, a Green, and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a Liberal Party person, maybe maybe One Nation. It's, you know, you, you've got to, that's when you, you've got to fill every square in. You know, you remember that thing you see at the top of the ballot paper or on, on the how to votes, the handout, you're going to, you had to number every square. So what happens is you, you're allocating, if you're voting Lib Dems, you're putting a one there, you've then really got to think about the order of your preferential votes about how you want to then see that happen. Because if, if the Lib Dem mem, uh, candidate doesn't get across the line or doesn't get enough votes, the, that vote is taken out and put on a pile over there. And then ultimately it's brought back. Who did you vote for? Secondly, and that goes on someone else's pile. So it, it's really about um, who you decide to allocate your preferences to. Uh, of course, the party will, close to the election, put out guidance. And on the day you have how to votes, which actually tell, tell people this is what the party's recommending in terms of allocating the preference. And at the end of the day, the voter decides who they're going to allocate preferences to. That's always their right. We'll make a recommendation on the how to vote. Um, people can choose or, or decide not to follow that. But our, our, I suppose, our principle for our recommendation, as I understand it from talking to John Humphreys, our president, is going to be we will back parties that stood up for freedom first. So any of the parties out there who have been quite clear about being against this nonsense that's happened in the past 18 months, that, that we will be looking to allocate preference to them first and then you know, down the card, I, I suppose, there'll be the other major parties. Now, there is a couple of uh, questions here. We need a, uh, well, on that same thing, we need a voting for dummies webcast um, and also an explanation on how to vote below the line. Now, that is actually one of the things that uh, you can help volunteer on, and I've spoken to a few people about it for those who are very politically savvy and also good at writing. Um, we've been putting, we're putting together a few different eBooks and we actually want to have one about how democracy works because uh, a lot of us either don't remember from civics class or it's a little bit different from when we did learn it in civics. Um, 
So that is something that we will be working on as well. So, uh, can, I add, sure. can I add something to what Campbell said? Um, he, he's exactly right in everything that he said. There's another common misconception, which the major parties will try and fool you with, in that voting for a minor party is a wasted vote. This idea that um, voting for us might somehow magically stop the Liberal Party getting elected and end up with the Labor Party or vice versa or whatever you don't want, right? That's simply not true because if you vote for us, you, as Campbell said, you can allocate your preferences. So if you think that, you know, you like us and, but, you know, if we're not successful, you would like the Liberal Party or UAP or whatever party you happen to like, you just put them as the next one on your preference list, right? That's the way it works. So this idea that it's a wasted vote, voting for a minor party is total nonsense. Mm, agreed. And look, I, there's not many countries in the world which have this type of yeah, vote. we're lucky. But yeah. I agree. I believe, firstly, I believe it's a more democratic system. And secondly, if we're talking about as liberal democratic partisans, it does help us. I mean, if, if, if we had like America or the UK or many other countries, everyone just gets one vote, and if that candidate doesn't win, you know, it's a, it's a worthless vote. Well, then, I mean, this is why Nigel Farage goes very well in the European elections because, you know, they do have a preferential vote. But then in the House of Commons elections, he gets one or two percent because people say, look, I want him to win, but I know it's a completely wasted vote. Well, in, in our system, people can vote for the Liberal Democrats. And then, then, they have, then they have the luxury of saying, OK, if the Liberal Democrat doesn't win, I've still got a, a, a say on who do I... Who, who else do I want to form government? Yeah, the American system is is terrible, I think. Mm. Um, and it really just locks in a duopoly like what we've seen right. up there. Yeah. Like they do have minor parties. Yes. But, you know, everyone's <laughs> thinking, well, if I vote for the Libertarian Party or the Green Party or whatever, yes. um, I'm going to take away a vote from the Republicans or Democrats. So no one votes for them. And I think it's a terrible system. It's mm. a good system for a little party to become a big party. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Now, I'm going to finish up on one last question because it is a good one and leading into some of the other work that we're doing. And it is from someone who will definitely be a, a panellist or a guest on this show at one point, the great Ross Cameron. Uh, and Ross says, Campbell mentions the likelihood the election, of the election campaign will move from COVID to climate change. Along with COVID and climate, what do the lads think are the key battlegrounds of the 2022 campaign and how is the 10-point plan coming along? And by the 10-point plan, we're talking about the new Freedom Manifesto. I get so many emails from people saying, what are your policies? Where are your policies? Everybody, uh, our policies are being updated and simplified. And I know John Roddick has been working with the policy wonks about our new 10-point Freedom Manifesto. I'll take, leave it over to you, John. Well, look, just a couple of ones which are worth highlighting. So we're going to really focus. I mean, we're not a major party that's got to come out with a, poly, a detailed policy on every single little policy there is out there. We're going to focus on 10 policies. So obviously one of them is going to be about COVID. One of them is going to be about energy, cheap energy. Uh, but a couple of others I would like to highlight now is we are going to support uh, recall elections. Now, not many countries have recall elections, but the really great dem democracies do. Like the, the best democracy on the planet is actually Switzerland in terms of how they, uh, you know, it's a very decentralised country. And it's also not coincidentally a very successful country, very harmonious country. But a recall election would be that, uh, and look, there was recently one in California. If you have an election and you've got, say, uh, you know, a, a, a member of parliament, or, or look, let's talk about what happened in California recently. So they had an election two years ago. The governor, the incumbent governor was considered unpopular. Now, then they needed to have about, about somewhere between 5 and 10% of every registered voter in California to sign a petition saying, we don't like the job he's doing and we want to have a fresh election. Now, 5 to 10% does not sound like a big uh, uh, hurdle. It actually is a big logistical issue, uh, problem. And, it, you know, to, it, and half the states in America have recall elections and they do not happen often, but they do happen occasionally. So we would have it so we can recall a parliament if we have a sufficient number of people uh, signing a petition or we can recall a particular politician. Now, this is the key thing. It's going to happen really rarely, but just the fact that it's in place is going to be a check on political power. Politicians are going to be 
a little bit more reluctant and a little bit careful if they know that they could, you know, and this is one of the bad things about fixed terms. You can be in, you know, you can think, I'm not going to be kicked out for four years and no one can do anything about it. Okay, well, a recall election can do something about it. And that's one of the things we're going to champion. And then another thing is the surveillance state. We're going to very much wind back the surveillance state. We're certainly going to be proposing it. And, you know, the, and uh, things that have been getting passed recently, and all these surveillance things came in after 9-11, and we had the war on terror. And for about 10 years after 9-11, every nine months, somewhere in the world, you know, including Bali on our doorstep, and Spain, France, England, you know, there was a big dramatic terrorist attack and it freaked us all out. And I can remember at the time saying, go for it, government, go for it. You know, bring in all these surveillance laws. We need to stop these terrorists. And a small number of people, including the Liberal Democrats, people like David Lionhelm, were warning, saying, OK, well, look, if you've got to do this, Let's have a sunset clause so when it expires. But there's no sunset clause. And surprise, surprise, <laughs> the legislation was designed to catch terrorists who wanted to drop a nuclear bomb on us. Now who's it, who's it going to get? Well, the way it's going, it's going to be it's going to be getting kids that haven't worn a mask before too long. Yeah. I, I totally agree, John. And this is this is one of the things that people don't understand about um, many things in politics. When there's these emergencies and these powers come in. They never go away. That's what I'm so scared about with the pandemic. Yeah. Um, the government has gotten so used to using these extraordinary powers and we have to fight tooth and nail to make sure that they're all removed and then some if, if we can do that, but we have well, to fight and, it. And just, just very quickly chipping in, it, that's exactly the case. And I've seen it up close. Um, to, we don't have time tonight to, to talk about it, but I've seen absolutely the results of power and then overreach. But I'll point out one to you that's going on at the moment that we've seen. That is these damn QR codes that were brought in for yeah. public health, yeah, yeah. at least one police service in this nation, using them to track criminals or yeah. you know, or people they think are criminals. It's I, just not on, you know? I love, it. I love it. The governments love these QR codes and there's no sunset talk about them, is there? No. You know what they're using them for in Victoria? They're running a trial at the moment. They're linking them to your uh, immunisation record and using it as a way of excluding you from businesses. They're testing it in regional Victoria right now. Yeah, um, my good. only say, my only um, optimism on that is that their entire system depends on a, a government IT project being completed on time, which <laughs> anyone who's been involved in government IT projects will know that's just a fantasy. So I'm sort of hoping that incompetence will save us there. But, it never you know, happened. Never happened. Yeah. Well, to finish up, there's a lovely, sweet little comment from Jim saying, all four on the panel have done a fabulous job tonight. It's our very first little episode. Thoroughly enjoyed it. You all deserve to log off and go enjoy a single malt. Oh, well, I'm going to, I'll have a glass of Pinot, but uh, oh, well, Campbell's already started. There we go. I, oh. I'm, I'm still at Parliament. I'm making the most of it while I'm still allowed uh, to come in here. So, But you didn't meet Sassy either. So oh, Sassy, was here. <laughs> Sassy was here, <laughs> my wingman the whole way through. Oh, what That's a beautiful girl. job. <laughs> well, I just wanted to thank all three of you tonight for our, you know, taking part in just, you know, just another crazy thing that we've decided to do. Um, and thank you all of our members who have been watching and contributing. We had a lot of questions. Uh, if there's anything burning that you really do want to ask, please Please feel free to email me at contact at ldp.org.au. My name's Kirsty. Uh, I will shoot it off to whoever should be best answering. Um, so all your questions will most definitely be answered. Uh, and so what will happen from now on, we're gonna have this as a regular Friday night thing for members who register. We'll have, might switch out some of the panelists here and there because David's gonna be ending up all over the place at the moment with some of his crazy things. Uh, and obviously we're gonna, John's gonna be so busy, Campbell's gonna be busy. So we'll switch out some of the panelists, but these three wonderful men are going to be our, our stable panelists. Uh, and then obviously what we'll do is edit it all up and splash our logos around and then we'll put it on our social media and on our website. So never be fear if you do miss an episode or you want to share it around to your friends, because obviously we definitely do want you sharing all of our social media. So make sure you're following John, David and Campbell on Twitter, on their Facebook page and on their Instagram page. And you can also look at and maybe sort of out ratio some of those mean tweets that Campbell's been getting to. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I'll uh, read out a mean tweet when I get one. 
Yeah, when you get one, you're going to get love, love hearts. You feel like I get left out, mate. I'll just get, I'll do a mean. You can do one. For you. You, you I'll can, do a mean. Yeah, you can give me a Dorothy Dixon mean. <laughs> <laughs> or at least this bastard named Campbell Newman said. Oh. Maybe this like uh, Namble Cooman. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all tonight for. Uh, as I said, thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. It's going to be a very busy week ahead. But as I said. Emails in if you have any other questions. Bye, all. See you, Bye, Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks so much. Gentlemen, thank you.